box office top 10 brought to you he doesn't say with comscore but i don't think there's any other place to actually you know i i am sometimes offered alternative charts but i say no i'm with comscore are you with did you get canvassed by them yes do they come knocking on your door saying they cross the road saying have a box office top 10 and i go no 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 my heart is with comscore i've devoted my life (laughs) to comscore anyway at number 24 the nature of love which i thought was surprisingly uh enchanting and you know it's it's a kind of it, when you see the trailer for it it looks like a really annoying rom-com but actually the film itself is i think rather tender and has got a very interesting take on what people want and what people do and the conflict between those two things number 16 is the 50th anniversary 4k restoration of the conversation one of the, the great movies of the 1970s, if you haven't seen it, take this opportunity to go back and see it in cinema. And as Walter Murch, who was the brilliant sound designer on it, said, the strangest thing about it was that the film with probably the greatest sound design of all time lost out at the Oscars to Earthquake, which is a film which goes... Uh, 14 in the States, number 13 in the UK is Kill. Yeah, which is kind of like Train to Busan meets The Raid. Um it, it says kill on the title. The title comes up halfway through the film, after which they just kill everyone. Have you just spoiled it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think if you go and see a film called Kill and then the killing happens and you're surprised or you think that's a spoiler, yeah. you need to get out more. Fair enough. Number 11 is Blue Lock the Movie, Episode Nagi. So here's an email so, from Will. Oh, good. Yeah, Mark excellent. Simon, alumni of Exeter University here, who once had the pleasure of watching Mark interview Simon about a book he had authored in our actual oh, yeah. auditorium. I remember that. Yes. And you made a joke about my good. Cornish pasty shoes, which I still have. Yeah, it was Mad Blood Stirring, available from all good bookshops. What a, what a tale that is. I am writing in response to Mark's review on Blue Lock. As someone yes. who had watched and relatively enjoyed the show, I went to see Blue Lock episode Nagi yesterday evening. In summary, the film is a recap of the first season, but from a different character's perspective, with perhaps 20 minutes of new scenes spliced between existing scenes from the show. I was looking forward right. to seeing the film to see an interesting character fleshed out, but sadly the film didn't really add anything for me and I that I didn't already know or couldn't be inferred about the character just from watching the show. I found the editing to be messy and became confused as they quickly sped through the equivalent of 24 20 minute episodes in the space of 90 minutes. And I'd watched the show only last year. I'm not really sure right. who this movie was meant to be for, as it mainly served as a recap before the second season comes out later this year. It might be good to watch in preparation for the second season release, but definitely not worth a cinema trip. That's Will. Okay, that that's really fascinating because, as I said, when I saw it, I had no idea what was going on, having not seen the series. And and I that that firstly, my question was, well, is it a movie? The fact that it's got the the, the words of the movie in the title, and secondly, the, the who is it for question is really interesting because if it's not for the fans of the of the series who already know this stuff, then is it to bring new viewers on board? And I that would be me, and I was left baffled. Um, so thank you for that insider view because I had no idea what was going yes, on. Yes, Will, thanks for that. And Jack Philipson says, I'm not personally a fan of Blue Lock myself, so I can't comment on the qualities of that particular film, but I don't need to have seen it to know that the answer to Mark's question, why is it in a cinema, is yes. because it was a popular anime TV series and popular anime TV series get spin-off films. Sometimes yep. these films essentially function like extended episodes of the series. Sometimes they retell or reimagine the story of the series. And sometimes they are literally the TV series re-edited for a theatrical release. The Blue Lock film is is in the second category since it follows the events of the TV series from the perspective of a different protagonist. Notable example from the first category that Mark may have seen is Lupin Three: The Castle of Cagliostro, which was spun off from the Lupin Three TV series, which was airing at the time. It can actually end up being slightly irritating for me as, as an anime fan in the UK when a series I like gets a film because only a few of the most popular series will get an international cinema release for their films. The ones that don't end up in cinemas here often don't end up going straight to streaming either. So they can be a bit difficult to get hold of. Anyway, interesting inside right. information from Jack Phillips. Yes, thank you. As always, uh, we rely on the listeners. Thank you very much for those two very, very informative and very interesting uh, emails. Into the 10, uh, Jat and Juliet 3 at 10. 
Yeah, which is the sequel to Jack and Juliet 1 and 2, yes. and I haven't seen it because it wasn't press screen. If it's still there, it's at number nine. Still doing better than we expected. I mean, it's been in there for, uh, is it eight weeks now? So, yeah, it, you know, holding on in there. Kinds of Kindness uh, is at number eight, <laughs> number 11 in the state. I just won't be around for much longer. You know, well, you know, it's this is this is this year's Bo is afraid for you and me. Um, I, I really liked it. You didn't really like it. I thought it was funny. You thought it wasn't funny. Um, divisive is the word. The Garfield movie is at seven. Yeah. Uh, Cal- all right. Okay, that's fine. Uh, number six is uh, Kalki, two thousand eight hundred and ninety-eight AD. Two eight nine eight AD. N- now, this is the sci-fi movie that wasn't press screen. You remember that I said I was going to go and see it over the weekend? Oh, yeah, yep. It wasn't playing here. No. Well, it's t- So I will go and see it if I can find a cinema that's playing it, but it wasn't playing the here. The Bike Riders, is it number five? Not the film, perhaps, that the poster suggests or indeed that the trailer suggests, but uh, I liked it very much. And as I said before, if you see this and you like it, check out Catherine Bigelow's The Loveless to which it owes a very great debt. You could also, if you're doing your sort of background, you could watch the Marlon Brando, the wild one, although we had a very interesting correspondence a couple of weeks ago from somebody who had done that and got back and watched the wild one and found it really problematic. Uh, Tim uh, said, this is on the subject of Maxine, which is at number four, oh, right, right. new entry number four, right. uh, and also number four in the States. Uh, this is from Tim Brudenell. Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award. I recently went to watch yeah. Max Threen at the wonderful and sparsely populated Arc Cinema in Beeston and had a great time for the first hour. Mia Goff is brilliant as always and Kevin Bacon is having the time of his life. The look of the neon-drenched seedy Hollywood underbelly was incredibly well-realised, feeling alive and dangerous. However, yeah. the last 30 minutes descend in, it descends into pantomime silliness with the final confrontation seemingly dropped in front dropped in from a bad 80s action film it feels rushed with out of nowhere character reveals and multiple off camera deaths it fails to provide a satisfying conclusion uh, to the main character's story or emotional arc a special mention to lily collins's yorkshire accent if it wasn't <laughs> if it wasn't for her literally saying the words i'm a north yorkshire I'm girl from yorkshire, yeah. i wouldn't have known the accent that she was attempting <laughs> It was like going on a tour of the entire British Isles with the car radio randomly tuning into different local radio stations at every other word. A bizarre, distracting and completely pointless character detail. Luckily, she was only in the film for two scenes. It's a shame to leave the series on such an unsatisfying climax. However, there are still plenty to enjoy in the performances, visual flair and moments of brutal gore. Uh, That's from Tim and James in Basingstoke. Uh, I was a huge fan of X and I thought Pearl was even better. Maybe my expectations for Maxine were too high or maybe nothing can top that Pearl finale. But I felt that although Maxine had some interesting elements and ideas, it didn't feel anywhere near as satisfying as a whole. But something else bothered me. I'm a child of the 80s. Over the last decade or so, I've really loved films like Drive and Censor. But in the same way I have superhero fatigue i feel i also have quasi 80s fatigue or quasi 80s fatigue. Right, okay. i feel there are just too many films and tv shows that are trying to emulate the look and feel of the 80s what's wrong with just watching old episodes of top of the pops presented by up-and-coming <laughs> baby-faced simon mayo friday night's bbc4 also maxine was my third 18 rated film at the cinema last week after inner violent nature and kill as a psychopath wow. and fan of splattery films like Robocop, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'd really like to see a film where someone's head doesn't explode. <laughs> well, try if, I would say. I'm thoroughly desensitised now. That said, the end credits were perfect, as was the choice of song. Yeah. James and Basingstoke, yeah. thank you. So that's Maxine at number four. All right. Well, I've, I, I know a few people have been uh, down on Maxine and uh, and have said it's the weakest of the three. Although I think it's, you know, I mean, X is great. Pearl is really, really great. I mean, I really enjoyed Maxine and I did the interview with uh, with Ty West. I'm going to grant you 100% Lily Collins a- accent. And what we really need is for Jason Isaacs to do a Lily Collins tour of the world. Yes with that voice in the same way as he did with Russell Crowe when he did Robin Hood. Yeah. And you're quite right. If she didn't actually say I'm a Yorkshire girl, you wouldn't know what accent it was she was doing. So yes, that is distracting and completely weird. Beyond that, I mean, I think maybe I'm just mesmerized by Mia Goth's performance. And I did really enjoy the film. I did really enjoy the film, evidently more so than than other people. And the thing about the 80s throwback, I mean, we've had movies like The Guest and we've had uh, 
you know things coming out in in VHS boxes when nobody nobody's got videotape anymore. Yeah, I know, I know, we've had a lot of it, but I, I, I you know, I'm, I still have a fondness for it. But but you are right. You could always watch Top of the Pops two or whatever it's called on BBC Four on Friday night seven eight o'clock. Yes, I always get strange messages from people saying, that's a ridiculous suit you're wearing. And I suddenly think, <laughs> oh, I must be. I must, oh, Top of the Pops is on. Yeah. An old Top of the Pops <laughs> making uh, kind of quips about whatever is on in the news, which obviously make absolutely yes. no <laughs> sense at all when shown a quarter of a century later. My favourite thing about those Top of the Pops introductions are the people standing next to you, very excited about being on camera, who you know have all got a videotape of that moment. Yes. A friend of mine the other day literally sent me a, a little video clip of, of one of those Top of the Pops intros in which their face is apparently evident in the background for about a second. And they said, you've got to look hard, but it is there. I'm not quite sure. Okay. Yes, <laughs> I, will, I, I, will, I will do that. And these, these moments are very important. There, there was a period in the 70s where the girls slash women were always draped over the presenter. The presenter. Yeah, but yeah. there was obviously a point where everyone thought, hmm, maybe you not. You didn't go in for all that not. nonsense, did you? No, there was no yeah. draping by the time I was there, but that was 1986, you know, so I yeah. think the draping period was mid-70s. Anyway, yeah. we moved on and the world got better. Uh, in the charts, number three, number five in America, Bad Boys, Ride or Die. You know, it's taken a huge amount of money. Um, I've... I, I, I didn't have much fun with it, but other people appear to have done so. So, you know, hey, it, it's just franchise fodder. Uh, UK number two, A Quiet Place, day one. So as the correspondence from last week was saying, it has certainly succeeded in once yeah. again managing to make audiences go quiet, which in this day and age is a remarkable thing. I don't think it's scary, but I think it is tense. And I think that Lupita Nyong'o is terrific in the lead role. And the UK number one movie and number two in the States is Inside Out 2, now the highest grossing film of the year as far as the UK and Ireland box office is concerned. It's now in the top 25 grossing movies of all time and is Pixar's biggest movie ever. Well, it just goes to show that all those things that worried me about whether or not it would, you know, it would land as solidly as Inside Out, you know, were completely... We're completely wrong. I mean, I'm really, really pleased it's done as well as it has. It's been great getting emails from people who have been to see it with their kids um, and had really profound experiences with it. I, Inside Out was my favourite film of the year it came out. I don't like this as much, but I think it is still pretty remarkable. And like I said, you just you can't argue with the responses that people have had. People have had proper, properly moving uh, time in the cinema with their family. And as we've mentioned many times, the thing about grossing and biggest movie ever measured by financial take is problematic because that's not necessarily the same as bum. In fact, it's definitely not the same as bums on seats. Uh, it just means it's just everything is more expensive. But it's a clear indication of the fact that it's a massive film. Yeah. Yes. I. I. I think. I think they can pat themselves on the back and go, "Well, we got away with that." Yeah. And they'll probably be Inside Out three in a few years' time, based on that. You yeah. would imagine. 